Good morning, Faith Family. It's a joy to see you guys here this morning. Welcome as you guys are making your way in. Our hope this morning is our time together will be an uplifting time together where God will work in your lives, and bring you some joy and some hope. Uh, so let's stand together as we begin worship this morning as we sing out. Our God. Trust forever in your name, in the name of Jesus. We trust the name of Jesus. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. Forever in 
Have a seat. Is there hope at the end? At the end of a day, at the end of our lives, at the end of this world? The last book of the Bible, Revelation, helps us answer these questions. It gives us an understanding of where we lie on the timeline of eternity, shifting our perspective on what we currently see as the end to something that is just the beginning. C.S. Lewis wrote about this, saying, all their life in this world and all their adventures had only been the cover and the title page. Now at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has ever read, which goes on forever, and which every chapter is better than the one before. Join us as we study Revelation, the end of the beginning. Good morning, Liberty. My name is Pastor Drew Wallingford, and I just want to welcome you um, to the House of Friends this morning. Um, as, as you can see from that video, we're going to be starting back on our um, on our uh, on our message series through Revelation um, with Pastor Andrew. Uh, he's been on vacation for a couple weeks, and uh, thankfully we, we get him back um, next Sunday. And so uh, just hopeful that you guys will come out and, uh, and just join back with us on that series. I'm super excited. It's been very life-giving, um, even to me and my family. Um, and uh, so if you are new here this morning, um, we call this place the House of Friends um, because we want it to be inviting. We want it to be a place where you can connect and, and be a part of. So if you're new, um, you should have gotten one of these on your way in the door. Um, if you can just fill that out and put it in the offering as it goes by, um, or even just uh, at the connection desk on your way out, um, we would love to connect with you and just uh, help you to get to know us a little bit better. Um, we have a lot of really cool things coming up in, in the church as well, too. Um, if you want to help um, students, uh, kids really, actually, um, come to know Jesus, we're actually doing our VBS. It's August 9th and 10th. Um, and we need volunteers. Um, so if you would like to volunteer for that, uh, we have sign up on our website as well as the connect connection desk over there as well. And then next Sunday is actually a really big Sunday as well too. So if you guys have kids um, of any age coming here uh, at Liberty, we want to invite you um, to be a part of an event that we're doing next Sunday night. And it's Bring Them Up Sunday. Um, so not only on Sunday morning, we're going to be graduating all of our kids up so if you have a, a fourth grader who's in fourth grade right now, they are on next Sunday, they will be a fifth grader um, here in our, in our ministries here. Um, and that's all the way up. So even our high schoolers, our seniors, we're going to be graduating them at that event next Sunday night at 6, 6 p.m. Um, and we're going to be welcoming our new sixth graders as well, too. So uh, just want to make sure that you, know, you guys know that you're more than welcome to come and be a part of that as we celebrate what God's doing next in those uh, students' lives. Along with that, I just want to invite our offering team up, and I'll pray for us this morning. God, we just want to thank you, um, Lord, just for this place, God, this place to come and, and be in your presence, God. Um, we just pray that you would just come and that you would just impress your word upon our hearts, God. Would you call us forward to what's next, God? Call us forward into you, Lord. 
We want to learn something new about you, God. We want to focus on you this morning, God. So push away the distractions, God. Push away the things that are going on outside of this place, God. Um, and help us to carry you with us when we leave. Uh, we love you so much, God. And so we ask that this offering would just go straight to you, God. That you would use every cent for your name, God. For, for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In this time of desperation When all we know is doubt and fear There is only one foundation We believe We believe In this broken generation all is dark you help us see there is only one salvation we believe we believe we believe in god the father we believe in jesus christ we believe in the Holy Spirit, and he's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that he conquered death. We believe in the resurrection, and he's coming back again. We believe. Let our faith be more than anthems Greater than the songs we sing And in our weakness and temptations We believe We believe
to mercy falls my attention you were waiting at the door and I let you in You carried all the blame, breaking the curse of our condition. Perfection took our place. When only love could make. Take this love away. My only desire, my sole ambition, is to love you just the this morning.
Let us pray together this morning. Great Heavenly Father, we come into your house, the starting place of your kingdom, God. And we give you praise and we give you honor because you are worthy. You are creator, you are savior, you are redeemer. You are so many things that we could never hope to be, but it is through you that we can be made into a new creation because you so willingly gave your son to come and to live teach us your ways to offer up his life as a sacrifice for the sins that we've committed to pay the ultimate price upon the cross and then to get up out of the grave conquer death conquer sin and offer up to us life everlasting if we would just simply confess our sins confess that Jesus is Lord place our faith upon him, the great Savior, the great Lamb. So this morning, let our words that we sing, the words that are spoken, be an offering of worship to you that pleases you, that glorifies you, that brings honor to your name. Lord, we seek nothing but to be in your presence be in the presence of the one true God over all the universe. It is in this time that we give you love, praise, devotion. It's your name we pray. And amen. Amen. Have a seat. So as we mentioned earlier, um, Pastor Andrew is still on vacation. Yeah, very lucky of him to go off into Florida and, you know, have some fun with the family. So um, what that means for us is that we get the awesome pleasure of having um, another guest speaker. Um, and I'm pretty excited. Uh, first service was really cool. So I really i am excited for what um, what is coming for you guys. So uh, with uh, without further ado, what to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Rodney Phillips. Um, he's from the Carolina College um uh, of biblical studies, sorry, I don't know, that's a long, that's a, a mouthful, that's like, CCBS, yeah, that's a lot, <laughs> so, <laughs> I guess that's probably CCBS, I'm going to stick with that, so, um, but uh, I'm going to pray for us this morning, and then he's going to bring some word for us, so, um, God, we just want to thank you, um, just again, so much for just showing up here this morning, God, and we just want to pray and ask that you would just, um, just stamp this word on our heart, God, would you send your Holy Spirit to just um, just nudge us in the right directions, God, and, and, and show us um, what is next for us here, God. Um, we just praise you for what you're going to do, God, and we just expect that it's going to be amazing in you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Pastor Andrew. I know he's been a blessing to you folks in the time he's been here already, and that's an answer to prayer and evidence of the Lord's work. Let's take our Bibles and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1 is our text this morning, especially verses 8 through 12. I'm grateful my wife accompanied me this morning, Scarlett, been by my side. Later this month, it'll be 37 years. Yeah. 
by the grace of God, so it is for his glory. She developed the PowerPoints for us, so I'm thankful for that as well. See her creativity there. We all know what shamefulness is. Shamefulness is telling a crude joke at a funeral. Shamefulness is a wealthy person shoplifting. We all know what shamefulness is. My daughter saw saw shamefulness recently. A customer came in to the bank where she's a teller, had a backpack full of cash. Our daughter says when this happens, it never ends well. She had uh, wanted to make a deposit. She said she wanted to deposit $8,000. She had this in cash. It was right after the state fair, so it makes it seem authentic and and my daughter took the cash, and uh, it was all mixed together. It wasn't in the right bands. Again, another sign this is not going to go well. She counted the money, and it wasn't $8,000. It was only $7,000. At that point, the customer accused my daughter, our daughter, of stealing $1,000 on the spot right then and there. She gets on the phone. She's being loud. She's calling people, acting like she knows people in, in high places of authority and is saying they need to contact this person and that person and get a hold of her lawyer. And she demanded that she wanted to see the uh, video feed, but the video feed doesn't stay there. It goes out to their security offices off-site somewhere, and she's saying they're lying and that as soon as she walks out, they're going to go back there and erase it and was causing a big problem. And I tell you, that's shamefulness because if something like that holds up, our daughter not only loses her job, but she'll never be able to have another job in the financial world ever again. That shame on her. We all know what shamefulness is. But in contrast to that, do we know what it means to be shameless and unashamed? And to help us learn more and grow in this area of being unashamed, we turn to the example of the Apostle Paul this morning because Paul could boldly declare, I am not ashamed. And this is quite remarkable considering the circumstances in which he currently was living out. Paul was in prison as he writes this letter to young Timothy. And the prison was a subterranean cell below ground that probably was originally part of the city's water system that had finally through the years not held water anymore. They turned it into a prison. Or some say that it was a part of the city's sewer system that wasn't functioning anymore. So it was a horrible condition. Below ground, it was cold, it was damp, it was dark. Probably rodents all around. And yet he could boldly declare, I am not ashamed. And he writes to Timothy, whom he left in the city of Ephesus as a pastor. And as a young pastor, he's pastoring this church, and Paul is continuing to disciple him. And he calls upon Timothy to be unashamed. Because if you were in close association with the Apostle Paul at that time, you were also under the heavy hand of threat for persecution. Nero was the Roman emperor at that time. And Nero wanted to enlarge his palace, but in order to do that, he had to get rid of many, many homes surrounding his palace, citizens' homes, and so he burnt them, he burnt the homes down, and he blamed the Christians. And in the course of events, he imprisons the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul then is in prison for for unjustified reasons, and ultimately because he wants to preach the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, And yet in the midst of that circumstances, he declares, I am not ashamed. And Paul also was very highly motivated. And he's leading the way for his young mentee, his disciple Timothy, to likewise be motivated to be unashamed. And in this paragraph, as a part of this letter they wrote to Timothy, here's his emphasis. Unashamed to serve Christ, anticipating a reward from Christ. Unashamed to serve Christ, anticipating a reward from Christ. Now, what's the reward? Because it can't be heaven itself, because heaven is a free gift. 
So what's the reward? And how strong a motivation factor is it? Unashamed to serve Christ, anticipating a reward from Christ. Paul in our verses, primarily verses 8 through 12, says unashamed of the person of Christ, unashamed to suffer for Christ, unashamed to serve Christ. Now notice the text in verse 8. Paul says he's unashamed of the person of Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. In the first half of verse 8, Paul says, be unashamed of the person of Christ. When he says, do not be ashamed, that is a command. And that command is placed upon us. And here we are not to be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. The testimony of our Lord. He is one who suffered unjustly, and yet his suffering produced eternal results. So the testimony of the Lord is not only his life in perfection, in obedience to, to Almighty God, but also his death, his burial, and resurrection. Do not be ashamed of the testimony, the work. Do not be ashamed of the person of Christ. Now, if you're going to be unashamed of the person of Christ, just know that that puts you in direct opposition to Satan and his world system. You have just been targeted as an enemy. And therefore, to varying degrees, you and I will experience some level of persecution. Thankfully, in our great nation, it's typically not direct, but it still nonetheless can be real. You'll be demeaned by your peers, perhaps. You might be passed over for a promotion because you are not ashamed of the person of Christ. It puts you in direct opposition to Satan and his world system, and therefore we can expect to experience a certain level of persecution. But Paul says, be unashamed to suffer for Christ. He continues in verse 8, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. Unashamed to suffer for Christ. The character of during our suffering is that of bold courage, unashamed, bold courage. And the cause by which Paul was suffering here, he names it as the gospel. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 11, he calls it a glorious gospel, unashamed to suffer for the glorious gospel of God. And yet I also want you to see the connection that a believer has while we suffer. You notice in verse 8, once more, verse 8, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Do you see that Paul does not say he's Nero's prisoner? He is not Nero's prisoner. He is the Lord's prisoner. He is the Lord's prisoner. You may be a soldier in the greatest army in the world, under contract with the United States of America, but ultimately you are the Lord's soldier. You may be a student in the greatest college in the world. What college is that, you might ask? Carolina College of CBS, otherwise known as CCBS. Case in point right here, right? Greatest college in the world, okay? You might be a student there or a student anywhere else, and yet ultimately, you are the Lord's student. You might be an employee of IBM, BMW, or Wells Fargo, but you are ultimately the Lord's employee. Paul says he is the Lord's prisoner, unashamed to serve Christ. And, and Paul, in this connection, invites Timothy to join him to suffer together for the gospel. Now, what does that mean? Is Timothy supposed to leave Ephesus and travel all the way to Rome and walk into that 
uh, prison guard and then get himself uh, thrown down in that big old uh, prison below ground and lock himself up? Is that what it means? No, Paul was n- never one to suffer on purpose. He would always avoid martyrdom, given the choice. They helped rescue him out of town many times. We never suffer on purpose. We don't go around looking for it, inviting it. No, that's not the point here. But what Paul is saying is be unashamed in suffering along with me. Be faithful in suffering according to the glorious gospel of the Lord. Unashamed of the person of Christ. Unashamed to suffer for Christ. And then in verses 9 through 12, unashamed to serve Christ. Unashamed to serve Christ. How are we going to do this? Well, Paul explains something of God's power in verses 9 through 11. Verse 9 it's and 10, it's God's power to save. Now look what God has done in our salvation, verse 9. It's according to the power of God, verse 9, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our work, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted to us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. This is what God has done in our salvation. You notice the action is he has saved us, past tense. The basis of our salvation is not our works, he says, but the source is God has granted us. It's a gift. We receive it when we place our faith and trust in Christ and Christ alone. And the time of this is from all eternity, so God's plan has been unfolded with Christ as the one who would atone for the sins of the world. God's power to save, that's what God has done. Now in verse 10, the emphasis is upon what Christ has done. Verse 10, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now this is what Christ has done in terms of God's power to save. He came and made this appearing and he abolished death. Now what's the appearing of Jesus here? Well, it could be his incarnation in which he was born here as a human. But when did he abolish death? When did he render death ineffective? That was at his crucifixion. And then his resurrection removed man's last enemy, 1 Corinthians 15, which is death. So this appearing here might be a reference to his resurrection. And this is the means by which God brought life and immortality and eternal life to each one who would believe in the saving message of the glorious gospel. This is God's power to save in what God has done and what Jesus has done. And God's power, though, not only is in terms of to save, but also to serve. Notice verse 11. Here Paul says, according to this gospel for which I, and the emphasis is upon him, for which I, I myself was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher. Those were the areas of Paul's service under God's appointment. Likewise, each one of us serves the Lord in various capacities. And God's power not only affects our salvation, but enables us to serve him unashamed to serve Christ. Now, God's power is what has brought Paul to a very, very firm, firm persuasion. Notice verse 12, our persuasion. Verse 12, for this reason, I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed And I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Paul's persuasion, he makes that declaration in verse 12, I am not ashamed. Then he gives the explanation that shows how firmly he was persuaded. For he says, for I know, the word know there means to know it by perception as a fact. I know as a fact the one in whom I have believed. Now, notice he he does not say, for I know what I have believed, though that would be true. But here he says, for I know whom. It's a relationship 
with a personal God and the person of Jesus Christ himself, for I know whom I have believed. And here's the foundation for his belief, his persuasion, the foundation I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted unto him. Here's the foundation for how Paul is unashamed. Here is the foundation for how you and I can likewise rise to that high and holy calling to be unashamed in the midst of our challenging situations as enemies of Satan and his world system. Here's the foundation. That phrase, he is able. Is able is is one of the words that describes God's power. Now, I want you to see the flow of the text and the emphasis here uh, of how Paul develops this concept of the foundation being God's power that enables us to be unashamed. I want you to notice the flow of the passage. So go back up to verse 7. Verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but has. So it's present tense. We've already received this. As followers of Jesus Christ, we've already received this. We have received a spirit, not of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. So this is the position of power that we already have because we are in Christ Jesus. But then you notice how verse 8 ended. Paul says, I'm suffering for the gospel according to the what? Power of God, so that we appropriate that power in suffering. And then back to verse 12, where Paul says he's convinced and he knows that God is able. That's the perception. We know it as a fact that that power is all sufficient. We know it as a fact. God is all sufficient. That's our perception. But then how do we appropriate that? How do we see that's the foundation for being unashamed? Well, just drop down to verse 14. Verse 14, guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells, present tense, in us. So the Holy Spirit is always within us, and the Holy Spirit is the person who continually enables us to appropriate God's power so that we are unashamed of the person of Christ. And the basis of the working of the Holy Spirit, that's the basis for how we are unashamed to suffer for Christ. And this is how we are able to be unashamed in our service for Christ. This is Paul's very firm persuasion so that he could declare, I am unashamed. Persuaded that God is able, his power is present as the regard to that foundation for courage. But then Paul ends verse 12 with his motivation. Motivation. He says, I know who I have believed, verse 12, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. That day. There's coming a day in the future in which there is an event, the Bible calls the Bema or judgment seat of Christ. All believers will appear before Jesus himself, and that event is not to determine if we get into heaven because that's a free gift. Heaven is ours. However, the Bible says that Jesus Christ is going to review review to what degree we have been good managers or stewards of what he has entrusted into our care that would not only include all of our possessions, but it would also include everything that he has gifted us to accomplish in this life. And the Bible says he's going to review the quantity of our works, but also the quality of our works and the motive of our works. And the Bible says that each one of us individually is going to give an account in that regard. And when he reviews that level of faithfulness and that level of unashamedness, he's going to reward us properly. Paul always had in mind that day motivated him to be unashamed. But but continue in this passage, again, just seeing the flow of the passage, down to verse 15 next. Verse 15, you are aware, Timothy of the fact that all who are in Asia 
turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. Now, those are two that were not unashamed. They were full of shame. Verse 16, however, the Lord grant mercy to the house of Onesiphorus. It's house of Onesiphorus. We think that he himself has died at this point, but he is the head of the household and the other, le- the other members were considered faithful as well. It says, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. Now, that's the third time in this passage in which Paul has emphasizes emphasized being unashamed. Verse 8, verse 12, and now verse 16. Not ashamed of my chains. It's quite remarkable because verse 17, when he, Onesiphorus, was in Rome, he eagerly searched for me and found me. I tell you, it was a dangerous mission to look up the Apostle Paul at that time and to enter into that actual location where Paul was in prison. It was a very dangerous mission. But he was unashamed, had bold courage, and he set out and actually found Paul. Verse 18, the Lord grant to him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you know very well what services he rendered at Ephesus. Paul always had that day as a motivating factor. One more in this same book, 2 Timothy. Go to chapter 4. Chapter 4 and verse 8. Chapter 4 and verse 8. You remember these words well. Paul says in the future, chapter 4 verse 8, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me. That award will include these crowns. It will also include the reward of a public declaration of your entrance into heaven. It will also designate your level of authority and service in the kingdom. All of that is a part of the reward and other rewards as well. But you notice Paul's going to receive that particular crown as a part of his reward. But he also says, and he will also award to me. Do you see how personal that is? It's an award to an individual. We're going to be rewarded individually. We're going to be awarded these special recognitions individually. It's not going to be the kind of thing where you show up at this event and and Jesus is going to say, all right, everybody from A to M, go to that room over there and you'll see your names on the trophies and whatever and N to Z, go over there and hurry up. We got other things we got to do in all eternity. It's not going to be that kind of scenario. Romans tells us that each one of us will give an account individually. And each one of us individually will receive the appropriate rewards. That day was the motivation for the Apostle Paul. He wanted to be found unashamed in this day so that he would be unashamed in that day. Unashamed to serve Christ anticipating a reward from Christ. Here's our application. Number one, appropriate God's power to be unashamed of Christ. Appropriate God's power when you're in the heat of the moment and you need wisdom how to respond, when to speak, when not to speak, whether it should be a confrontational role or whether it would just be seasoned with salt. Appropriate God's power in those times. Number two, Appreciate Christ's companionship in your suffering. Appreciate Christ's companionship in your suffering. I love Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 11. I think you ought to write that verse down. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 11 says that Christ is unashamed to call us his brothers. Hebrews 2 verse 11, Christ unashamed to call us Brothers, companionship in the suffering. Here's another verse I think you ought to write down. Also in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 16. Chapter 11, verse 16 of Hebrews says that God is unashamed to be called our God. God is unashamed to be called our God. God the Father is unashamed of us. God the Son is unashamed of us. And we should be unashamed of them. Appreciate Christ's companionship in our suffering. Also, 
always abound in service to Christ. Serve Him without reservation. Abound in your service to Christ and anticipate Christ's reward on that day. Anticipate Christ's reward on that day. Unashamed to serve Christ, anticipating a reward from Christ. Our college is accredited by the Association for Biblical Higher Education, ABHE. And this year, some of us on the administrative staff there at the college attended the annual conference, We Suffered for Jesus, in February in Orlando, Florida. That's suffering. (laughs) And as you can well imagine, the last night of the conference, we had a huge banquet, this big banquet room, 500 plus people there, all sitting around these round tables, and we were going to enjoy a delicious meal, which we in fact did. And, and of course, all the hotel or convention staff is the one who's, uh, you know, putting on and serving us this dinner. And, and they did an outstanding, amazing work of service that evening. They brought us our salad, removed those dishes. They brought us the main dish and removed those dishes. They brought us dessert, removed those dishes, plus water, tea, lemonade coffee, and anything else we needed. And it was just amazing how efficient and quiet they went about doing all of this in the midst of carrying on a program. And one of the gentlemen I had been observing because I was just so impressed at how smoothless and seamless this was, one of the gentlemen I noticed seemed to be over a kind of a huge region, and um, he stopped by our table to, to do something, and I just complimented him and said, well, you, you all are doing an outstanding accomplishment here. And as he immediately turned to walk away, he said, oh, you, you guys have been a great group. We'll not skimp on service now. We'll not skimp on service now. Now, I think that needs to be the motto of every believer. And as a church family, you adopt that motto, we'll not skimp on service now. God has been too good to us. We're going to appear before him on that day. I tell you, we're not going to skip on skimp on service now. I tell you, as a church family, you adopt that as your motto. And next week, when uh, thank the Lord, Pastor Andrew will be back. And, and you, one by one, tell him, that's my motto. I tell you, he's, he's going to be passed out on the floor. Because you don't have too many churches that have that as their motto. We're not going to skimp on service now. Unashamed to serve Christ anticipating a reward from Christ. Don't start skimping on service now. Let's bow together in prayer. Thank you, Father, for giving us opportunity to worship together corporately, members of your family, members and attendees of this local church. Father, I pray your richest blessings upon them and being the greatest light in this area and an ability to support and encourage and exhort one another to be healthy, to be honoring to Christ, to bring glory and honor to your name. And we pray as we've looked at this passage in particular that you would help us to have wisdom to apply it properly, to experience the power of God on a daily basis. Lord, we welcome that and are so thankful. And so I pray that you would appropriate your word to our hearts according to our need. And we will thank you for it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, would you join me in just saying thank you? (laughs) Thank you so much. Really appreciate uh, you coming and sharing that word with us this morning. Um, And I just want to remind you guys um, to sign up to help with VBS. And uh, next Sunday we're doing that. Bring them up Sunday event. It's at 6 p.m. It's a potluck, so, uh, but everyone is welcome. We want to celebrate what God is doing next in our students. Um, but without further ado, have an amazing Sunday. You guys are loved. <laughs>